All right, well, if everyone can uh, take their seats. Uh, we've heard a lot over the past day and a half about uh, technology developments, not only here in the United States, uh, but also uh, particularly in Europe and China. And so in their infinite wisdom, Scott and the other members of the TPI uh, asked us to organize a final panel with three extraordinary members who can talk a little bit about what is happening in China, Europe, and in the United States, and in particular in the United States from a Federal Trade Commission perspective. Uh, we're greatly honored to have these three uh, people with us. Uh, as you will probably uh, know when you see me up moderating, we will follow a traditional approach that I take, which is I've asked each of our three guests to speak for a few minutes to ensure that they get an opportunity to tell you what they think is important for you to know. I will ask a few questions of each of them. I'm hoping for a little dialogue amongst the four of us, but then we'll be going quickly to questions from you all. So please be preparing your interesting and feel free to be controversial questions for them. We're going to start with uh, Minister Chen from the Chinese Embassy in Washington. Minister. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think any discussion about the Chinese science and technology policy, uh, before we can do that, uh, I would like to provide three points for as a background information. First, I would emphasize China is a developing country <coughs> because China's, everybody are talking about the fast economic growth of China, talking about China as the second largest economy in the world. But don't forget, the per capita GDP of China is still less than 9%. It's about one-seventh or one-sixth of that of the United States. And the spending of medical, Medicare, education, for per capita for China is far below that of the United States. That's one thing I want to emphasize. Secondly, China enjoyed fast economic uh, growth, and we are now able to invest heavily on research and development. Last year, the uh, investment, the R&D expenditure is 2.12% of GDP. And I think that percentage is more or less dissimilar, more or less the average of the OECD countries. And we are now able to publish a lot of papers. In terms of paper published and in terms of citations, China ranked in world number one. But that's one side of the story. The other side is that the uh, citation per paper is still below the world average. From 2000, uh, 2007 to 2017, the Chinese paper, paper uh, uh, authored by the Chinese uh, scientist, enjoy the citation of nine, around nine uh, sites. But the world average is about 12. So that explains we are still lagged behind with the world. Talking about the technology side, people always, uh, would like to uh, use the uh, triadic patterns. China is making progress fast. For 2018, we hold something like 3,000 triadic patterns. But that's only about 5% of the world total. At the same time, United States holds something like 30%. But remember, we move up quickly. Just in year 2005, the triadic patterns held by China accounts for only less than 1% of the world total. And third point that I want to mention before we can discuss about Chinese te uh, technology policy is that globalization is important. We realize, realize, we realize the importance of globalization, and China, Chinese government is willing to get into cooperation and keep in contact, have exchange with all the countries in the world. 
In fact, now we have uh, come into more than 100 uh, science and technical cooperation agreements with different countries, including the United States. Even though there are some minor problems to extend the agreement with the United States now. So I think that it, uh, because the, the Chinese government's emphasis on the uh, cooperation, international cooperation, is based on the belief that science, first, science itself is an open enterprise. And secondly, <coughs> innovation will only take, take place when you try to involve in manpower, knowledge, technology, capital from different corners of the world. So that's why we emphasize uh, a great deal on the international exchange and cooperation. That's it. Well, thank you very much. Well, let me, let me follow up on that point about cooperation. As you point out, uh, this has been an important part of Chinese policy now for a number of years. Uh, obviously, there are tremendous economic and other tensions right now between the United States and China. How are you seeing that manifest? Trade is obviously a very big part mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. How are you seeing this manifested with regard to science and technology cooperation? Are you finding it increasingly difficult, or are you finding that it is independent of these other issues? In fact, with the, we, we, we should better call it the trade tension between the United States and China. I think we, uh, from, from the media, from scientists, we, we, we're starting to feel the pressure on the normal exchange cooperation between the United States and China. For example, people are talking about the um, uh, uh, limited time frame of visa application for, for students from China majoring in science, especially majoring in those areas who were, uh, uh, which is considered to be uh, uh, sensitive and uh, uh, national security related areas. And as we just, as we talked, during the uh, uh, coffee break. National security can be a very broad term. So that's one of the concerns. The other one is that, as I said, uh, innovation would take place in different parts of the world, and merging, acquis merging acquisition is a, one of the, uh, a part of the process of the innovation. Um, uh, but people are now, are now talking about the uh, more screening of the uh, investment coming from China, even uh, the investment from Chinese business into academia research is sometimes uh, uh, screened. So that's my worry and concern, that the future contacts and cooperation between United States and China may be uh, influenced by the current trade con uh, conflict or tension. Uh, following up on that, point, uh, there's recently been uh, legislation passed by our Congress and signed by the President uh, that tightens up a number of things. One is it affects Huawei, ZTE, and their ability to sell uh, into the United States to government users. Uh, and similarly with CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and new uh, requirements for and restrictions on uh, investment coming in from countries, including China. How has that been received by the Chinese government and Chinese industry? Uh, we, we, we followed the, the, uh, the change of developments in the, uh, in the current, uh, uh, by the current administration and also the reform of CFIUS. Uh, the national security is cited as one of the reasons to, to, to tighten the, the control and, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the data, of the technology, of merger and of investment, but um, uh, as I said, as I said, Chinese government has also is concerned about national security. But if national security is interpreted into everything, then the normal exchange and cooperation can be uh, 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 influenced. That's Very my worry. Thank you, Peter. Well, I think. Um, I'm going to echo a little bit what Minister Chen has said. I also want you to understand uh, where the European Union in terms of tech policy and digital policies is today. Um, you, you know the European Union, I always present it more as a project 
then, then what people perceive it very often as a country. You know that last year the European Union had its 60 years anniversary. And it's a project in the sense of it has a lot of variable geometry. Many people say, oh, it's a group of 28 countries. Well, it depends. Uh, if you talk about Schengen, there are a couple of other countries there as well, which are not a member of the Union. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you talk about research, innovation, and digital tech, or Horizon 2020, there are another 10 countries which are part of, of that initiative. And the same is true for a customs union we, we have with, with other countries. So I think I also would like to pass to you a message that the European Union is not a monolithic block. It is a project where people or member states come together to find <clears throat> supranational ways of, of, of solving problems which, which concern all of us. And digital is certainly one of the top priority in these conversations. You see that best that uh, this commission, the Juncker Commission, starting in 2014, has elected digital to its sort of main priority. President Juncker talks about a digital union today. He talks about digital priorities as the main prism through which he's looking at other policy areas. If we talk among the college about agricultural policies, we talk about precision farming. We talk about farm to fork and how that supply chain is going to work. So we talk about digital tech. It's equal to the same thing when the college addresses climate change action. They talk about innovative technologies. They talk about changing consumption patterns. So these are all digital technologies. And not surprisingly, over the last few years, the European Commission has been proposing and tabled quite a number of legislative and non-legislative actions on, on digital and tech policy because we are on this process of transforming the European society and economy into a digital society and in a digital economy, in a data-driven society and a data-driven economy. So this, this is sort of, this is not a topic being added to the policy program of the European Union. This is like a horizontal foundation which is being built, permeating all other policies. It could be security policies or, or anything else we are dealing with. Now, you, you, you know very well that uh, everybody here knows the GDPR and everybody appreciates, I'm sure, how good that piece of legislation is. But <laughs> I was told to be funny at certain point in time. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was the most easy one I had. <laughs> but everybody appreciates this GDPR, but it's an expression. Particularly, you see, that's an expression of these underlying big values. And you can safely assume that the European Union is not going to slow down in these reflections or not going to slow down in, in trying to put in place these, these guardrails for industry, for society, we think are necessary for that digital economy. Now, you can ask me what are the main topics, and let me just to conclude maybe pull a few out of thin air almost, because we have done like depends how you count, some, some 50 legislative, non-legislative acts over the last three years, and there's plenty coming up in the next few months still. But, but some, or one of the major elements we have been working on is what are the rules of the road we need for data? And that's almost the logic of data as a piece of information, but what needs to be attached to it in terms of when the data moves around, what are the rules? What needs to be attached to it in terms of, of data protection or privacy protection on, on those data? And this could be personal data, and we have done great work there. But we also have done work on public data. There's a lot of European public data, which is maybe not as used as good as it could be, and not as fluid as it should be. This is about business data and how to combine public and business data to create multi-sided data markets there, for instance. This continues into scientific data. I mean, what are the rules of the road for scientific data to get the maximum value of the public investment in there? So you see, it's a conceptual approach we have taken there. Equally, we have been working a lot on cyber, and that's obviously something we're going to continue having a lot of conversations also into the next commission, which will be starting in summer next year or in autumn next year. So cyber will continue there. And I think in cyber, I, I want to be more humble on that one because uh, I think we have not invested enough in the last few years in this area. We have not invested enough at the national level and we have not invested enough on creating the networks across Europe to deal with the 
cybersecurity situations we have today, and we have not invested enough in bringing the industry and creating a fluid European cybersecurity operational defense capacity. So we have not done that yet. I think we are in a good way, but that will take time to build this capacity. And just to round off, like everybody here, we are dreaming about artificial intelligence day and night. Uh, we're not entirely sure how this is going to work out. What we have put in place is a strategy on how we want to approach that. That strategy focuses a lot on, on the ethical principles. Uh, <coughs> I think there is in Europe a desire or a view, let's put it, a view that artificial intelligence does not need to come as fast as possible for any price. I think this is a, there are people who have concerns and we should address them. And if AI comes a year later, it's also fine, sort of. So it's not here as a technology to replace human beings and society and our jobs overnight. I don't think this is what we are looking for in the European Union. But I'm open for conversations around these topics anytime. Very good, thank you. Let me, let me ask a little bit about those last couple of topics that you just mentioned. Uh, as you point out, um, the Juncker Commission has as one of its primary core uh, focuses a digital economy and growing the digital economy for Europe, uh, reflecting in part, I think, a widespread view within Europe that over the past decade or so that they've lost the step that they once had as a result of 3G and the like to China and to the United States. A lot of discussion about the lack of major European high-tech companies uh, and the growth of uh, internet companies in China and the United States, the list of the 100 largest are dominated by those two other economies. What is it that from a European Commission perspective is being done uh, to promote new investment, whether it's on telecom, cyber, internet, AI, and the like, uh, to try to create jobs and new services to compete with the, the rise of China and the continued rise of the United States going forward. There is a sense often that there's a lot of rules, but not necessarily mm -hmm. a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. I know this has been an area of great concern to you and to your colleagues. How is that being addressed? Let me take three three different perspectives on that. The first one, the European Union is, continues to be an open trading partner. That there are companies operating on the European market which are US headquartered and very successful is not a problem. It's not a problem. It's a welcome partner because they bring a lot of jobs, innovation, and create a dynamic environment. That companies have to follow rules within a jurisdiction, I think we are not debating here at that point in time. I think that is quite a given and an obvious. So therefore, all these companies are welcome. Of course, it would maybe have some, some European politicians would have liked some European companies in that field to rise. But there are, there are maybe. And that's how I'm moving to the second perspective. I think the European economy is very diverse. There are lots of champions one may not know necessarily. And I'm just pitting it the one, I mean, everybody knows SAP. Well, you know, maybe they are the, the Google of industry. That's how you can perceive them, because they run, uh, what, what's the slogan? Best run factories are run by SAP or something like that. So I think there are plenty of companies which are not necessarily appreciated here as global champions. The Olympic Games are run by a French company since years. They are the tech provider, the exclusive tech provider for that company. That's from from running the tables to security to everything. They run the total, total digital infrastructure. So there, I think there, there is something. But the, the third dimension where you say the investments, the European Union is investing, and I think now the research investment in Europe is just a bit above 2%, which is a decent figure, which turns out to be something like $350 billion a year. So there is a lot of research ongoing. I think there's a lot of research cooperation with the United States. No matter what the trade relationship with the United States are these days, these relationships are there since decades and most likely will outlast any, any administration either in Brussels or in Washington. So I think there's, we see no change in this kind of relationships between universities, academic sector, startups, working or coming here to learn how fast you can move your startup and then coming back and putting the 
accelerator to the metal. So I think we see a lot of investment there. I've been personally working on a program before I was posted to Washington with an accelerator where we had the 1,048 startups. I mean, that's also the magnitude of accelerators we have back home in Europe. But I have also to say, and that I'm closing that answer, I have also to say I love to bring people here to the US because it's, it's a really great exposure for, for researchers, for people with ideas, for young people, to give them a sort of a different perspective. Life can be a bit faster than south of France sometimes, you know. <laughs> That's why we like to be in the south of France too. That's right. Very good. You raised AI uh, before, uh, but one of the things which I haven't heard as much about recently is 5G in Europe. Uh, we've heard a lot about 5G mm. in China. Uh, we've heard over the past day or so about 5G, including on the last panel, about whether or not it, that how transformational it's going to be. But 5G with Internet of Things and that type of uh, uh, set of services implicates things like GDPR and others as well. What's the sense about how things are going on 5G in Europe and as it compares to international benchmarks? Uh, I, I think the previous panel was actually very interesting in that. Uh, I think the, the big telecom companies have the same issue in Europe of they're not necessarily seeing immediately the consumer business case. I mean, they have a faster connection, people are not willing to pay more. And don't, don't forget that uh, that 4G or mobile subscription in Europe are dirt cheap. So it's not going to be very easy to move those customers from like a $15 subscription to, to $20 or, or give them something which they would be ready to pay, to pay more. So there has been a lot of focus on industrial applications. Uh, there is a 5G action plan, a European 5G action plan, which fo focuses very much on industrial applications, focuses on transportation. For instance, in Europe, uh, the, the model for autonomous driving is a connected driving. So we have put in place infrastructures already along certain stretches of the road, which are 5G, or are going to be 5G enabled now, where cars can drive autonomously, connecting to other cars, connecting to the infrastructure. Europe is densely populated, so the model is not necessarily autonomous driving. The car has all the information and technology. No, a European autonomous car would be closely connected to the infrastructure, closely connected to other cars or vehicles driving on the road. So this is where 5G would be a fantastic case, and this is what we are pushing very hard. Sure. Thank you very much. Commissioner? Thank you for having me. And for those uh, who are not familiar, the Federal Trade Commission uh, enforces both competition and consumer protection laws, including many that intersect with uh, the digital economy space, including some privacy and data protection laws. What I, what I want us to reflect on a little bit today is when the globe looks at the United States and uh, looks at the attributes in which they admire about our country, of course, there's a lot of facets of culture and openness, but there are, there's also admiration for our business culture too. Um, the fact that some of our industries have flourished to the point of uh, being leaders in so many sectors, um, whether it's financial services or certain manufacturing sectors, but of course, in the past generation, our consumer technology sector, um, whether you judge it by market cap or whether you judge it by employment or simply impact on society, there's no question um, its outsized impact has been tremendous. But I, where I want many of you to think about is that trust is the glue of uh, markets mm. and society. And I think our technology sector is right now confronting um, some questions about trust. And we need consumers, for our markets to work well, we need consumers to have trust. Um, and if we reflect just 10 years ago, 10 years ago, in the summer of 2008, we are talking about when hearing about the failure of IndyMac to Hank Paulson talking about taking over Fannie and Freddie and ultimately the September bankruptcy in Lehman Brothers. We all learned there that the, the deterioration of trust had catastrophic effects and it did not just impact those of us in the United States, it impacted the European Union and China deeply. 
And the way we think about flows of capital, there are a lot of similarities into how we should be thinking about flows of data. Um, data and capital move at speeds that are unlike any other type of good. Um, and thinking about how we can constantly be creating an environment where trust is high. And there's just, again, there's no question that the incidents of the past year and a half, two years, have raised questions for many Americans about what they can trust. 90, according to one survey, 91% of Americans, uh, adults, have feel they have lost control about how companies are collecting and using their data. Um, this sense of losing control um, is something that I think we should worry about uh, for, the, for the future growth of the sector. So one of the things I want to talk about is uh, how we might broadly be thinking about privacy. So the FTC, as I mentioned, enforces some privacy laws. Uh, I am of the view that more privacy protections uh, is not really about if, it's about when whether it happens at the federal level uh, or whether it happens through a patchwork of state laws, whether it happens through foreign laws that impact our companies that create global standards. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do think that that is going to be um, the reality. And for me, I want to make sure that the US is not sitting on the sidelines when it comes to privacy. I want us to lead. And I want us to come with the lens of how can we advance privacy protections while also promoting the competitive atmosphere and environment that has led you know, our, our industry to flourish here. So I think firms are now all in the mindset of what is going to happen, what do we do? And I would counsel, I always counsel firms that all, all firms in this sector need to think about how, how, don't just think about regulation, but think more broadly about consumer trust. Because we all saw what happened 10 years ago, and I don't want to see what happened to the financial services industry happen to our technology industry. So the FTC is going to be holding a series of hearings this fall. It's been mentioned already. There are several topics um, that I seek to explore the intersections between privacy, big data, competition, uh, what the FTC's uh, remedial authority should be on data security issues. Um, I am of the view that uh, our markets will work and function better uh, if we have clear standards on data security that are enforceable and that have some real teeth. Uh, but that, that conversation, I hope, uh, is one where there can be a broad perspective of views, but also hopefully we can get to some consensus and not think reflexively that any regulation is inherently bad. It's really about how we sculpt it. I also think it's important not just to think about uh, formal laws and rules. And I th uh, as privacy issues continue to intersect with national security issues, you know, the, the number of data breaches that uh, have occurred in the US in recent years, uh, you know, even putting aside the massive breach at Equifax, um, it is becoming routine. And we know that that data is going to the dark web, is being transacted, uh, and often misused by non-state actors. So I think in addition to working together on a regulatory solution, if that exists, I think we also have to have more cross-border conversations about encryption. And whether the, how we think about law enforcement, um, consumer protection, and privacy with respect to encryption is, is very important, uh, very important that we advance that discussion. Um, I'm, I'm a believer that back doors for some become back doors for others. Uh, and it's not enough for us to simply give tips to consumers to change their passwords. Um, we have to be thinking about this with technolo technological solutions um, and solutions through the democratic process. 
So I, I, I will say that cross-border flows of, of capital have been critical for the growth of the entire society to make it more inclusive, or at least aspire for it to be more inclusive. But cross-border data flows are also going to be increase in importance. Uh, currently, uh, the US and the EU, as well as the US and others, have agreements around the privacy shield, the extent to which um, EU citizens' data uh, is protected when, when crossing the Atlantic. The FTC um, is very committed to vigorously enforcing privacy shield commitments. Uh, but I think there's going to be ongoing conversations with jurisdictions across the world about how each jurisdiction is protecting the privacy of, of citizen data no matter where it sits. Each of our countries have a, di a different uh, history, culture, all of that impacts how we view privacy and data. Um, and the key is to figure out uh, how we will look out for all of our citizens. Terrific, okay. thank you. That, that, yeah. You covered a lot of, a lot of territory there. Let me, let me ask uh, to follow up. You talk about, particularly in the latter part, about data security, a hope for consensus within the United States, and then perhaps some sense of consensus, I assume, globally as well, or at least interoperability uh, and the like. You've looked at these issues now for some time. You're new to the FTC, but you've been an expert on these issues and thought deeply about them for some time. What are some of your preliminary thoughts about what that path forward might look like, both in terms of the nature of those rules or regulations or understandings, and also how do we get to consensus in what is obviously a very uh, sharply divided uh, political uh, environment? Yeah, so one of the things I've thought quite a bit about is, if for the first time in um, the US economic history, Actually, our, the, the growth of our technology industry in terms of market cap um, has been like no other uh, since the Civil War. And I think what I, I encourage enforcers and regulators to also realize is that many of our technology companies that are um, large and influential were not so large and influential a, a decade or more ago. Many of them recently became public companies, are new to responding to the incentives of public markets, whether it's debt or equity investors, and are actually also new about how to engage um, in policy debates. And I, I think there can be an instinct to want to put a stop to uh, enforcement, put a stop to new regulatory regimes. And I think it's fine to uh, express a point of view about regulation that might not be good. But sometimes it, it, it means more to be productive and constructive. And that's something that I think is part of the maturity cycle of, of many companies that they deal with. So I, I, I always urge people to be um, attuned and respectful to that, that this is not, these are not 100-year-old companies. With respect to preliminary thoughts on data protection, I, I have reflected quite a bit. Prior to this, I was a, largely a financial regulator. And one of the key laws that consumer financial regulators in the US um, have, have in, been impacted by is the passage almost 50 years ago of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And the Fair Credit Reporting Act was responding to concerns about companies maintaining secret databases about consumers that is, and, and that were making decisions about their lives. So we passed a law in 1970 saying consumers get to look at that data. They get to dispute inaccurate information. That derogatory information goes away at a certain point. Um, and that that data is subject to certain security requirements. So I, I think there has been a lot of reasonable laws that are not perfect, um, where we can look to how it was implemented and learn lessons from that. But respect to actually protecting, um, you know, securing data, there are, like I said, there are technological solutions, but I would like to see the industry be more supportive of, um, 
enforcement authorities, potentially with rulemaking that make clear what the expectations of market participants are, um, and that those who do not live up to that um, are deterred by financial penalties. Now, thank you. And related to that, um, traditionally in terms of privacy, uh, the United States has looked to particular areas and have different rules for different areas, healthcare being one, for example. Financial also, services. Financial services yes. another, and so forth, uh, and had sort of sector-specific privacy. Uh, as Peter pointed out, you know, GDPR is less that way and more of a general view across board. Do you have, uh, Commissioner, do you have any sense of looking ahead? Mm. Is it better for us to have um, a set of general privacy set of rules to promote trust that apply across the board? Or is it better for us to try to disaggregate in some fashion and have separate rules for separate industries? Well, I think that the challenge with having a stovepiped um, privacy regime or the way in which these are implemented are often done through systems that are common across industries, uh, using technologies that are common across industries. So, you know, I do think there are some, some uh, advantages of convergence. At the same time, I don't, I think there are a lot of, there are a great deal of data that is collected uh, about consumers that may not fit the exact auspices of financial data or health data, but that when combined together using machine learning and, and algorithms can draw very, very clear conclusions um, about a person's health status, about a person's economic status, about a person's race. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I don't think we really contemplated in our sector-based approach. So I'm gonna be all ears during our hearings, but my, my gut tells me that um, at the federal level, there's going to be states that get ahead. There's obviously going to be, the GDPR is going to be something that deeply impacts uh, firms in the US and that I, I'm watching that very closely. But I, I am of the view that to, we will need to increase trust, uh, just like when we dealt with the Fair Credit Reporting Act and, and um, that in order for us to maintain high levels of trust, we will need to find ways both from firms and how they communicate with consumers and, and, and how government can support that too. I, I will say that if I could just add one thing, you raised the question of um, investment from China in the US um, and the role of the CFIUS. You know, I hope it's clear to everyone that Merger enforcement by the DOJ and the FTC is very separate from any CFIUS review process. Um, they are reviewed completely separately using different standards, as just as there are changes in China about how merger reviews are conducted. There's now um, a streamlined number of agencies. They are the FTC is continuing and the DOJ to engage with our Chinese counterparts. And um, I think we have always promoted a view that whether it's CFIUS or whether it's merger review in China, that transparency and due process are ones that uh, we eagerly seek to promote. Mm, terrific, thank you. Uh, uh, Minister Chen, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about um, the views about privacy and data security in China. Uh, there was a fair bit of conversation on some of the panels yesterday uh, about the new laws that are going to affect in China, uh, some of the influences of the GDPR on that, and perhaps a difference between the role of the Chinese government and access to information versus Chinese companies and the like. I'm not an expert on that regard. I think that's always a good balance about the uh, protection and utilization. Because, as I know, the, the future development of AI depends on the um, uh, uh, right usage of the uh, uh, data, including the uh, uh, consumer data. So, uh, basically, I believe that there, we should find a good balance for the 
protection and utilization. In fact, I want to uh, make comments as what, what you mentioned. You mentioned a very good word, which I like very much, trust. Because trust is um, provide foundation for, for any kind of cooperation. Here I want to mention two examples. You know, a leading, a leading 5G uh, company in China called Huawei, uh, the United States federal government think Huawei has some connection with the Chinese government. So they deter decided not to purchase any products from Huawei because of the uh, national security concerns. While in China, in fact, people are all, are all also have the similar kind of worry because all the computer, all the uh, uh, operating system from Microsoft, mm. we think maybe that operating system provided Microsoft may have some back doors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people are talking about why don't we have our own operating system? In fact, this world is not organized, is not operating in this way. With industrialization, uh, specialization is important because globalization means overall efficiency, which each country specializing their particular strength area. So I think trust is important, right? If we don't have any trust, you always look the partner in your eyes as your advisory. Another example is that you know, after the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of countries have rolled out their own national strategy for, uh, for advanced manufacturing. The United States rolled out its uh, national uh, uh, strategic, strategic plan for uh, advanced manufacturing in 2012. And many of the ISS and uh, European countries, for example, uh, the, uh, Great Britain, rolled out their uh, advanced man manufacturing strategic plan. And Germany have their industry 4.0. Uh, China, in fact, learned from these countries and rolled out these uh, uh, made in China 2025. And we rolled out this strategy. In fact, as I said, it's n n no difference as all the other strategies rolled out by other countries. But when, <laughs> when the US media think about this problem. They, th they think it's a big challenge. They think that it will cause challenge to the national security of the United States. So I mean, that's a basic way of thinking. If you are, and here, here at, the, at this area, mutual trust is, is important. So I fully agree with you. Transporter, nation to nation trust is very important. In fact, the final objective made in China 2021, uh, 2025, is trying to upgrade the Chinese industry level. But currently, most of the Chinese industry are low end, energy consuming, very low efficiency. So what we, we just want to upgrade the industry with new technology, with information, with uh, like 5G. It's nothing else. So mutual trust is important. <laughs> very good. Peter, what is uh, the views of the European Commission on that? And particularly, take uh, you know, Made in China 2025, which focuses on things like AI, 5G, uh, chip technology, and the like. Does Europe see that as a threat or an opportunity? I would approach the answer to that question, you know, that uh, what Minister Chen just said, I'm, I'm fairly sanguine on that sort of, of, of arguments. You know that uh, the United States and Europe share a fairly common value set for, for centuries. And this is not going to be shaken by the innovation of some new technologies or, or things coming around. So I think Europe continues seeing the United States as one of the first and foremost partners when it is about how we are going to digitize this planet, and what are the rules of the road for, for, for this process. So therefore, I don't think that, that we would see, and that's unnatural to the European Commission in any case, that we would see other countries and rising economies and very good innovators as a threat. 
I don't think that is the, the right word. There are concerns, certainly. And I think, uh, for instance, Germany has yesterday tightened its suffused type of rules. They, so so there, there are concerns which then get expressed in, in, in change of legislation in this. But overall, as a process, I don't think that the European Union is paranoid and about other people as well attaining a level of, of welfare. They rightly deserve so, and I think that's not an issue in that sense. I think Huawei is a, is a very welcome company in Europe. It makes a lot of business in Europe. So I think this is something we can reconcile in, in, in our political conversations. For instance, in this particular context, it's the, the UK taking a lead on, on working proactively with that company on, on trying to see you know, that this technology is up to the security standards we would like to have in Europe. And that is happening today. So I think there are solutions far beyond conversations with a negative tone in that. But I like one thing that the commissioner has said about regulation and innovation. Because uh, when, when I'm on the road in this country, uh, I very often I hear this argument, you know, you, you're just a regulatory superpower. Uh, I'm not sure if it was a compliment. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, uh, but the notion of regulation is bad for innovation. That's, I think, a widespread belief, which I'm not sure if it holds up scientifically, to be honest. I think there can be bad regulation. Yes, I agree to that. But the equation of regulation is bad for innovation, I think, is too simple. And this is a little bit the space where I think the European Union certainly has taken in the last few years a bit of a leadership position in trying to build regulation which is innovation friendly. And now let me not exaggerate. The GDPR is an innovation driven regulation because it will force companies to innovate on the technologies to implement. It will force companies to work more on encryption, pseudonymization, and these new technologies you have been referring to. So as long as things are a level playing field, you know, I think we should be careful in seeing regulation as a very bad thing. Because we need it in these conversations. You have been pointing out about if we want to advance the, the, the values in terms of privacy, well, we, we should have that conversation and not always start with a negative point of view. And I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that certain privacy protections. I don't buy that it completely has to come at the expense of innovation and new market entry. Uh, I think it's really about how it's designed and that it is thinking about competition really uh, thoughtfully. I will tell you that. In my conversations with venture capital firms and other investors in the US, I think they are concerned about that they only, many of them feel like they have to fund um, new market entrants with the hope of exiting to a large incumbent. Writ large, uh, the amount of M&A activity is it is moving more in the direction of large firms buying small firms rather than um, going to the public markets for IPOs. And it is something that market entry and um, maturity of new firms is going to keep our technology industry nimble and constantly moving forward. We always, we can never, we never want to live in a society where someone can't start the next big thing in their garage. Mm -hmm. Once we've lost that, um, it, will be, it will be tough for us to stay in the lead. And that is something that, as Americans, we should embrace. And we should try and make sure that everyone, no matter where they come from, um, in our country has that ability to climb the ladder and start a mm -hmm. firm and let it prosper. But I, don't, I, I want to make sure that we are thinking about data protection and privacy, but also within the context of the broader competitive landscape, um, you know, in key sectors of our economy, especially technology. Very good. Let me open it up uh, to questions. We've got one already here. I do it the old-fashioned way, uh, not through the internet. Uh, <laughs> oh, 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 there's a microphone since it... 
people at home want to be able to hear it as well. I have a question for Minister Chen. Can you give us some advice for how we can think through whether M&A um, coming from China has a national security threat? And I ask this because I think there is a, a, a tendency in the US right now to see all Chinese commercial activity as connected to the military. And that's not true. We laugh at this, but that is the narrative that is dominant right now and I think informed a lot of the CFIUS reform. It is definitely true in some cases that there is a connection with the military, but not all, and there are actual real commercial drivers in China as well. But what advice would you give for thinking through in a more targeted, precise way so we can identify where there are real problems and where there are not? Um, so the most talked about problems or the major concerns from the United States towards China is uh, um, market access, technology theft, uh, forced or coerced technology transfer, as I, uh, the problems identified by the uh, uh, 301 investigation led by the Trade Representative Office. Uh, uh, from the Chinese perspective, we don't those problem, problems really exist. For example, as I talked yesterday with the commissioner, for example, the, 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 the so-called false technology transfer. Uh, in fact, you know, when, when China started opening up to the outside world in the, uh, in the late 1970s, we welcomed the foreign investment to boost the local economy. In fact, we give those foreign investment preferential treatment. They need to pay much lower income tax compared with the domestic Chinese companies. And the Chinese strengths, comparative advantage, cheap labor, local markets, raw material, things like that. While the foreign companies, for example, the companies from the United States, their strength is the comparatively advanced technology. So when they come to into a joint venture, most likely the, what the, the U.S. company can offer is technology. While the, the Chinese sides can provide labor, all the, uh, the, uh, the other elements for, for national production, to, to, provide, to produce the technology for the local Chinese market. You can find such cases in, in, in all the different areas. So that's not a real so-called false technology transfer. It's they come into joint venture only because, purely because of their business interest. And there's not a single Chinese central government or provincial government regulation ask for such so-called false technology transfer. The other thing is, the other thing is about the, the investment. I, I found the, some uh, the, the from the media, the, 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 the newspapers, have such allegations that the Chinese, especially during the past few years, made a lot of inf investment into the United States startup companies trying to acquire the advanced technology. Again, another fake news. <laughs> <laughs> because for, according to the Rodem uh, group, for example, last year, most of the Chinese, a big percentage of the Chinese investment is in real estate infrastructure. The investment in IC, ICT sector is only 9%. So it's not, it's not a dominant percent of the Chinese is, is put into the Chinese, uh, what, they, what they call the crown of the, uh, the pearl of the crown technology. No, it's not true. And the other, the other side of the story is that, I mean, uh, the, the value, when, we, when people are talking about the innovation, the value of death is a common problem for United States, for Europe, for China. So to, to build a, the bridge to, over, to solve this problem, to overcross the value of death, investment is important. Venture capitalist investment 
in, including international venture capital <coughs> investment. So for, for, for example, for a specific startup company who have uh, on a, a patent, a technology, nobody can make, uh, are quite sure whether 10 years later it will be a market dominant global company. Nobody are quite sure of it. Technology always, development always bring a lot of uncertainty and needs the investment to fuel the growth of such uh, startup companies. So if, uh, if you think that investment from China, from Chinese business into the US small business, it causes a uh, concern of national security, I think that itself will block the flow of innovation resources between different parts of the world. I don't have any, as to your question, <laughs> I, I, I'm not smart enough to, to give any specific suggestion to the United States government. But maybe the simple answer is that just keep enough respect and give enough trust to your partner, to different, to different countries in the world. I think that it is clear uh, on both sides of the Pacific, American firms and Chinese firms uh, have the perception that uh, they are treated differently uh, in the other jurisdiction. And um, you know, th that is something that I hear a lot with respect to merger review. Um, and, you know, the minister, minister and I have spoken about this, but I just want to pivot back that the more and more we can um, get our firms to talk, the more our governments can cooperate, I think. We, we, will, we will not solve it immediately, but we always want to make progress, especially with respect to due process and transparency. Especially if I can add one word. For, taking it, for example, when the treat representative office do uh, the, the uh, uh, 301 uh, investigation. At the same time, they listen to the comments and complaints from the US companies. If they can listen to some of the comments from the Chinese counterparts, they may be able to find a more full picture of the real story. Very good. Question over here. I'm trying to be geographically agnostic here. <laughs> Uh, Mark McCarthy with the Software and Information Industry Association. I, I want to pick up on the comments from Commissioner Chopra on, on trust and privacy and, and say that uh, in light of the GDPR developments and the California legislation, I, I think the, the tech industry has gotten the message and, and we're looking carefully at, at national legislation in, in that area. Uh, and I think the further comments that, that you made about regulation not being the enemy of innovation, but it depends on how it's sculpted, uh, are exactly right. So um, as we think about this, um, you mentioned the law that was passed 50 years ago, the FCRA, uh, which does provide strong consumer protections. It provides rights of access and correction. It provides notice for adverse actions. But it doesn't rely very strongly on consumer control over information. It, it doesn't rely on consent. And yet GDPR and California primarily rely on individual control as a way of, of protecting consumers. Um, and yet most privacy scholars who have thought about this and have looked at that experiment over the last 20 years have concluded that that, that kind of individual level control just doesn't provide good consumer protection. So. Um, how do, how do we deal with this going forward as we think about a new privacy framework for the United States? Is there, uh, what's the role of consent and what's the role of maybe other factors in providing a legitimate basis for data collection and use and dissemination? So I think that's, uh, I'm, I'm in no way trying to punt on it, but I think those are some of the specific questions that uh, speak to what I shared before about privacy protection while also promoting a robust, robust competitive landscape, and that will be explored in our hearings this fall. I will say, though, that the FTC reports um, and policy making over the past, I would say, seven years have all, um, you know, 
had some emphasis on access choice and, and but consent as well. Um, there's been a dimension of providing consent, express consent for certain types of sensitive information. We obviously are, and that this has not come up yet, but our non-sector specific, if you can call it that, privacy law, the Children's Online uh, Privacy Protection Act also has some elements with respect to uh, consent, uh, particularly when the data might be sensitive. So if I, had, if, I had a, if I had a crystal ball, my guess is that there could be some consensus that with respect to extremely sensitive data, um, consent will be part of that. Maybe some other forms of data might not have it. I don't know. I actually worry about being under-inclusive because the ability for uh, data brokers to combine disparate sets of data to draw very significant conclusions uh, about an individual that impacts uh, their housing, employment, all sorts of opportunities that were not contemplated by our discrimination laws. I, I worry about us being under-inclusive, but also want to think about uh, how it fits into the broader questions I raised earlier. Peter? I think, Mark, your question about consent is super interesting because, indeed, the GDPR relies a lot on that consent. But we, we know already that consent is actually a very bad way of managing your, your personal data. Uh, most likely all of us here have, have relationships, I don't know, with a thousand organizations, and there's no hope in hell we can manage, manage all of our private data in all these different organizations. With the GDPR, you have seen all these emails you got, and then you have figured out, oh my God, why do they have my data? I forgot about them a long time ago. So I think consent is, is under review right now, and, and any future privacy-enhancing technologies will very much focus on that. There's a lot of research going into that, how you can replace consent with other forms, which users can then more easily or, or more trustfully manage than just by clicking OK on all these other things you're seeing on the screen. So yet again, an, an element of where innovation comes in, because these technologies have to be developed. We don't have them yet. Research is ongoing, but it's far from, from products and services on the market. Very good. One last question, perhaps over here. Great. Uh, a question for Minister Chen and then um, one for Europe. Can you give us a, a sense for um, the, the Chinese government's uh, view on data center development and investment um, and how important that is uh, to the economy? And then uh, in the EU, do you have a sense for what the GDPR rules will do for investment uh, there in general? Uh, you mean, uh, you ask for data security in China? D data centers, sort of, such as 21 Vianet and GDS and so forth, that are, that are building data centers to house, you know, cloud, uh, cloud uh, technology and so forth. Uh, I think, may I refer that question to Madame Liu? I think she's in better pos position to answer that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I try to answer the, your question. I think in China, uh, the uh, data uh, IDC, the Internet Data Service. I think this is now is uh, the base, basic telecommunication service uh, according to the telecommunication service uh, classification, uh, the two, uh, 2015 edition. So I think the cloud service now is one part of the IDC service. So, now that it, so far it's not open to the foreign companies. But now that uh, I think the <coughs> Chinese government now is uh, uh, starting, okay. yeah, want to open this service to, to the foreign companies. So now uh, I think maybe in the future, yeah. Uh, but I think in China, uh, the technical service opening, I think is uh, larger and larger. And uh, um, such as in, in Shanghai, Fuenzong, yeah, we have lots of services have been opened to the uh, foreign companies, you know, such as uh, uh, the, some valued added services, and uh, maybe no limits for the foreign uh, uh, equation quarter. So I think this is, uh, uh, this is the current situation, but in the future, I think maybe have some change. Okay, thank you. Peter, did you want to address? Uh, very quickly. 
we, we issued a communication back in May, and one of the things in there was a number which said that only 4% of all data in the, generated in the European Union are stored within the European Union. Four. 96% are somewhere else. So this is, this is sort of the reality we are dealing with. So it's, it's organizations outside the European Union which are processing those data and storing those data. So which certainly means on how the GDPR is reaching this external, externality it has. Um, what is interesting, we have moved, I think, from a conversation of there is this new regulation and me as a company, I'm impacted. And yes, this means an investment. So this means they have to do something to a situation of where recently a company came to me and say, ah, we have made acquisitions. So now we are changing the business case and we are actually building a new data model for the new merged company. And in that context, they consider now the GDPR because there have been acquisitions in, in Europe. So I think in that case, GDPR is not necessarily an, an additional cost. It's rather part of of moving this business to the next stage. And there are always investments you have to take. You invest massively in a new data model. Are they gonna house the data here in the US exclusively or in Canada or in, in the Netherlands, like in this case it was? So these choices are to be made. And there I think GDPR can come in and, and just modify the data model this company is going to use for its business case they want to operate. But in the short term, uh, I think a level play, any level playing field Regulation will have a cost impact. I uh, do not want to deny that. Very good. One last question. Baron is waving frantically at me. Uh, I just want to res respond to the Chinese minister's comments about user trust. Sir, if you really care about the trust of users, maybe you should stop locking up people for expressing their views on the internet, sending them to detention camps, disappearing them, arresting people for selling dissident literature on the internet. It takes real chutzpah for you to come and lecture an American audience about user trust when your government is the most repressive government on the planet regarding the use of the internet. So what do you say to us who want, in the United States, we have the right to express our views. In China, your government uses every tool it can to suppress people for expressing their fundamental human rights to speak, to have access to information, and then you dare to come to this audience and lecture us about trust? How dare you, sir? He's uh, not with the State Department. <laughs> <laughs> How dare me? I, I think you made the wrong allegation. It's not true that we cannot express ourselves, uh, 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 express our uh, personal view f freely in China. It's not true. How can, how can you, get, where do you get this conclusion? How about Li Bo, who was disappeared by your government for selling dissident literature from Hong Kong? You continue to arrest people and then you lie about it. You are the most no. notorious government on the planet no. internet. Everybody the here in the United States, you have national security concern. We, 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 as well in China, we have this concern as well. You know, Baron, let him respond. Thank you. In China, we have in our national security concern as well. You know, in China, people can express themselves, but if you have any intention to overthrow the government, or cause, we believe, cause damage to the government, we won't allow it. That's a simple answer. That's why I dare to speak here. All right, well on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> let me thank our excellent, excellent panel for uh, what I thought was a very stimulating and informative time. Thank you very, very much.